might ask where I am in the moment. And I'm sitting actually in the moment in a very interesting place, far, far away from France. Okay, this is where I am at the moment. So I'm sitting in Shenzhen, and Shenzhen is that one city which has been able to, to grow within 35 years from a small village with, with just a few thousand people to actually 20 million people. So the, the picture you see on that uh, slide is actually a picture from the rooftop of, of our office and is showing the, the central part of Shenzhen. And the one tower on the left side, they just finished a few months ago, has is in the moment 600 meters. And believe me, they are building already the next one. Shenzhen is actually just one of many cities uh, around the Purva Delta which is also called the factory of the world because many products made in China are actually built here. So Shenzhen is, uh, with 20 million people, the capital for high-tech and for electronics. Directly next to it is actually Hong Kong with 8 million people, which is like the capital for import, export, shipping, finance, and investment. If you go slightly north, you will actually find Huizhou with 5 million people, which is focusing mainly on chemicals, actually. Dongguan is, is directly next to it with 10 million, with, where the whole city is focusing on plastic, clothes, wood, and this type of products. Guangzhou is actually the capital of the province with 30, 14 million people and is focusing on finance, software, and general production. On the other side, if you go down, we find Foshan with 8 million, where you will find thousands of factories just focusing on metal processing, aluminum extrusion, and similar type of productions. Jungshan with 3 million is focusing on lights and LEDs. Zhuhai with 2 million on software, AC, printers, and boats. And finally, Macau uh, with 0 0.5 million is like the Las Vegas here from Asia. Um, on top of that, they are adding also a bunch of super bridges in the moment from the one side to the other side to connect that super hub even stronger. And in total, they are living 120 million people in a radius of two hours. So you can take a car, you can drive two hours, and you will be from, from Shenzhen directly on the other side in Zhongshan, for example, or on Foshan or wherever you want to be. So within two hours around you are living 120 million people, which is bigger than any country in Europe. And as I said, they're all focusing on producing for the worldwide. Now, um, the interesting thing in China is that the Perva Delta is one super hub, but not the only one. So if we zoom out a little bit, um, you will find actually four super hubs which, are, which have impact on the global world. So the one around Shenzhen, so the Perva Delta, is a population of 120 million people and is focusing on high tech development and manufacturing. And as I said, it is actually smaller than Switzerland from the land size. The other one you might know is actually Shanghai, the center of the Yangtze River Delta which has in total a population of 92 million people and is focusing a lot on banking, finance, and business. Aging, uh, center of the data is actually with 24 million, not such a big super hub, but still the major one for politics, news, education, and actually also software development. And since a few years, the Chinese government is trying to push actually also a hub in the middle of China, which is in the moment Chengdu or Chengyu with around 45 million people. And this is actually turning in the moment into the new low cost manufacturing uh, yeah, for any kind of low cost products. Okay. Now, um, you might ask this next question, why am I here? Really nice numbers, nice cities. The question is actually quite simple. So just Shenzhen, did 270 billion GDP in 2015. So just that one city is making actually more turnover and revenue than many other countries in total. Um, just in Shenzhen, you will, for example, find the electronic market Huachang Bay. So on the left, uh, left picture, you see just one snapshot of that big market. It's actually like an entire district you can walk through and you will find every electronic component, every single cable, every chip, every connector, everything what you can imagine, what you would need for your product, you can find there. And either you just ask for a single piece and you might get it for free, or you can just directly order a few thousand or a million units because you need it for mass production. 
On the other side, you see now, for example, some of the factories which which are at Foxconn, which have really the size. So, in the moment, the factory in the Foxconn factory in Shenzhen scaled down from 300,000 people to 250,000 people. So, it's a quarter million of people working in a single factory, and the whole thing is really like a fortress with four gates in each direction, with manufacturing, with living, with hospital, with school for the children and everything else. So it's like basically like a city inside a city, which is just focusing on producing your iPhones, your iPads, tablets, and many, many other things. So basically whatever Silicon Valley is for software, Shenzhen is actually for hardware. You will find in Shenzhen actually also many famous Chinese companies which have here the headquarters. They started here and basically this is where they're at home. So you might have heard about TCL, about ZD, Huawei maybe. They're doing UMTS sticks also for Europe, DJI. They're making their famous drones. Lenovo is making your ThinkPads if you're using some, but also Skyworth or KingD which is doing TVs. But including companies like Compaq, IBM, Foxconn, Olympus, Philips, and Epson are home here, basically to access all the resources which are existing here on the Perva Delta. Plus, actually, also Baidu, Tencent, BYD, so some of the big companies you might also know are actually coming from Shenzhen and are having their headquarters in one of the high tech parks which the city has. And the interesting thing is that hardware startups are booming. So I'm already in Shenzhen since five years, and I see every month basically new startups coming to Shenzhen, either for just a short amount of time, so they might come for a week or two, but some are actually coming for a few months because they want to access these resources to boost their newest product or project on the next level. And there are actually many different reasons for that. So the one reason is that, that there is a strong maker movement. So we see many fab labs, but also business-minded engineers, which are actually now trying not just to work for their company, but actually now also to try their own thing. The complex technologies are getting easier available. So you are now, nowadays able to get a single chip or module, which is giving your product a complete smartphone capability or internet connection, or Wi-Fi or GSM or satellite or whatever. So all the things where before you needed an entire team, you can now just buy as a module, plug it into your product and you are done. Smartphones are also a very important thing. Nowadays, everyone has a smartphone, so many products can actually utilize that smartphone to be now the brain of your product. So which means that, that you don't have to need to put a display on your product, you don't need to put an expensive CPU, you don't have to put an, an internet module or whatever, you just have to connect to your smartphone and your smartphone will do exactly what it should do and extend your product to be the brain. And um, IoT is coming, so every one of you heard about Internet of Things, and uh, it is basically calling for complete new world of new smart and interconnected products. So basically every coffee machine, every chair, every table you have in the moment will be replaced one day by a product which is smart and connected. So either you wait till the company will make that product smart and connected, or you could be the next one who will actually turn that stupid product into a smart product. And cheaper components, Nowadays, you can much simpler source and you can also get a much lower MOQ, so minimum order quantity, compared to 10 or 20 years ago, where you had to be a big company and you had to order a million of pieces so that a factory is producing for you. Nowadays, you can actually go to a factory and even just ask for 1,000, 2,000, 5, or 10,000 pieces, or even just a few hundred if you really need it. Of course, also prototyping and mass production are getting easier and faster to access. And crowdfunding makes it easier for you to validate if the market really wants your product or not and is willing to pay for it or not. Plus, of course, online marketplaces are allowing global sales without that you have to invest huge in inventory and give 30% to distributors. So 20 or 30 years ago, you could not go on Kickstarter or Indiegogo, but nowadays you can easily. So you don't have to go to Best Buy or to, to Media Markt or whatever. So you can still do it if you want, but as I said, for a simple and, and cheaper beginning, you can just go for crowdfunding and people will already place orders if they like your product. Also investors, 
people love smart hardware. So after investing many, many years just in websites and apps and all the other magic, this market is overcrowded. So in the moment, more and more investors are actually looking to invest on products, which are not, not just software, but are combining now hardware and software to make something smart. So to be IoT, to be smart home, smart city or smart something else. Uh, you will see that investment in hardware startups is growing extremely. So on the left side, you see them on the chart indicating uh, the growth from 2010 to 2014, where basically investment raised easily 10 times as much as it was just a few years ago, and it keeps growing. Also, you see that the number of devices which are connected is growing exponentially. So like years ago, we had just big computers, which companies have to afford. Then at some point you could buy a mini computer for an office or for a school. Then everyone could actually uh, just buy a normal PC for home. Now what I see that there are web devices, mobile devices, or IoT, which are growing the number of hardware applications even faster than software applications can grow. Okay, after understanding now the possibilities in hardware development and hardware startups, uh, many people do underestimate effort and risk which is necessary to make that happen. So yes, I can put easily a prototype together, I can build easily an MVP, but really to bring a product from the first idea to something which is on the market and running for one, two or three years, wherever your warranty is ending and is not dying is actually something which is including many, many important things which you actually cannot skip if you want to make it good. So don't underestimate the effort and risk to make hardware happen. And uh, we have seen that many great ideas actually just staying ideas and that for some reasons. So we see that many people which have good ideas, they do it the first time. So they are lack of execution experience. So they never did it before. They do it now the first time. So there is a lot big of risk that they make it wrong or that they have to learn on the way and it's just taking longer. Um, there is lack of teamwork. So because they do it the first time, they might not have a team yet. So they might not have co-founders. They might not have partners which are able to cover the hardware side, the business side, the marketing side, the design side and all the other magic. Plus, of course, they are maybe also not experienced in working together as a team, in managing people, motivating, or even hiring the right people. And lack of support. So as they're doing it the first time, the market or parents or investors or someone else might not trust them that they are able to deliver. So they're not supporting them in such a way like it would make, it would be necessary to make their life easy. And last but not least, many people might not trust them. So even on Kickstarter or Indiegogo, if the product looks good, it's one thing, but seeing that many companies are not able to fulfill makes them people actually not trusting and then not to supporting these companies. Uh, and of course, they underestimate how much support is actually necessary for even a simple or medium big idea to really make it happen especially because an innovative idea is innovative because it was never done before. If it would have been done before, it would be easy, but it would be not innovative. So we believe that growing an idea needs a team to love it, raise it, care of it, believe in it, and let it go to the world. And similar like a baby, um, the baby is very fragile and can fall easy. It can break legs and arms or even die on an early stage. So you have to take care of it, you have to protect it. You have to help that it can start walking. But the later on you got the product more ahead, closer to the market and more stable, the more stable actually the, the child can walk and there's more assistance of different kinds of things which can go wrong. Now, how to access the Silicon Valley of hardware. There are actually three main things which would matter for you uh, to access, for example, the rich resources here. So on the one side, of course, gain experience. Experience matters everywhere. So there are many ch uh, chances to do things wrong. So the, the more you learn them to avoid them, the better. It doesn't matter if it's about development, about mass production, about finding the right people, about managing people, about picking co-founders or investors or whatever. Every experience you can make, everything you can learn to avoid if you make something wrong is something which is definitely necessary. 
Um, otherwise, you might fail by yourself or your competition might succeed just because they have more experience in something what you don't have. Second thing is build network and relationship. So no one will give you as outside of the same deal like an insider. The same applies for Paris, for Berlin, New York, Shanghai, wherever you are. If you're not from that place, it will be difficult for you to get the same deal. And especially in Asia, it's even worth relationship can't see even more than you might know from, from, from France or from Germany or whatever. So here it's even more important to build the right relationship, the right network, to maintain that relationship and so on, just to get good prices, to get good lead time and to good, uh, get all the other things. Plus, last but not least, you should know what you're good in and what you're not good in. So for things where you don't have a team yet, or where you're not good in, select a strong partner and strong partner means actually allow, it's allowing you to focus on what you are good and unique in why now the partner is actually catching the stuff which you're not good in yet okay okay there is one very important thing where we see that many startups don't see the big picture when they are at the beginning. So they have a good idea, they have a nice design, they have even an MVP, and they think they are finished, but they are not. They're actually mostly at the beginning of the whole thing and even don't see how much more work needs to happen to be there. Uh, and this is why we actually created or put together the whole product life cycle, which is showing nine different phases, which every product has to step through to be actually successful. Phase number one is the idea. Phase number two, design, then development of the product, prototyping of the product, market validation, which means confirming if actually the product is good or not, if the market wants it or not. After this mass production, sales, fulfillment, and after sales. So there are in total nine different phases we have to walk through to make your product successful. I will go now step by step into every single one of them and just show you quickly how much work actually is in every single one of them if you want to make it right and to avoid all the risks or mistakes which other startups are actually making. Okay, phase number one is idea. So usually uh, if you don't have the idea yet, then you will brainstorm an idea. So you might sit down, you might think, where's the market need? What are pain points in your life? What, what is, does your company need, your wife, your child, I don't know, the farmer or someone else? So you will just brainstorm randomly and try to put together as many ideas as you want, as you can. After this step, you have to analyze the idea because some ideas are more interesting and actually some ideas as interesting, some might have a higher risk, some higher reward. So there are different reasons when you are now trying to figure out from all the ideas you might have, which one you should pick to now develop the product. And analyzing idea will actually contain all certain things like you have to define the problem. You have to define the solution for the problem. You should define what is your target market? Are you trying it to sell it now to Africa, South America, to Europe, to do Japan or to everywhere? Who, what's your target customer in, in his age, in his function, in his money? So there are many things you have to define actually to position the product as it should be. Then you should take a look on competition because even you think you have a super good idea, imagine that someone else had already a similar idea before or that there's something else existing which is, which is trying to solve the same problem. Take a look on that, try to figure out what are the competi competing companies or competing products and try to learn from them as much as possible. Define also what are the features and use cases of your product, because without a use case, a product has no meaning or no reason. You should take a look on a technical feasibility, because you might have an idea of building a spaceship which is flying to Jupiter, but maybe it's not possible right now with limited resources or for the target market. You should also take a look on patterns, because maybe there's something part of your product which someone already patented and if you develop it then you might have to pay patent fee to someone or that person could say like okay i don't want to pay i don't want that you can produce it and will forbid it to you also a SWOT analysis is usually helping you to figure out what their strengths weaknesses opportunities or threats 
And finally, having a solid business model and business plan helps you actually to have a top level picture on the overall product and on the company itself, okay? After nailing down these few items, you should then actually start defining the product, which, which means you should define the functions, you should define the requirements and the specs. So something which is now putting all the information together, which you need or another team, team needs to now actually design it, develop it, or do market validation. So it should be some kind of document which you can give to an engineer and say, engineer, build me this, or designer, design me that, and they will just make it happen. Okay, so um, just on the idea phase, you see there's a lot of work to do, but imagine you just did it, you have one or two great ideas, and now it's going to, to the next phase, which is design. Uh, and of course, you should also uh, define, so you should plan time, budget, and execution for the next steps. The average cost for that phase might be 2K to 10K in US dollar, and it doesn't matter if you spend it now in-house or if you hire an external company for that, especially on patent research, but also on some other stuff, you might spend some money to actually get the data, to get the analysis, to get the lawyer involved, in actually checking your patents. So the more you do by yourself, you can get it cheaper. But if you completely outsource that part, for example, to build your PRD or to, to do, a, let's say, the whole analysis, then as I said, you might spend around two to 10,000 US dollar um, just to cover that part. Now, the second uh, step of the product life cycle is design. So here, someone needs to design the industrial design of the product, which means the outer shape, the surface material, and basically how it's looking and feeling from outside. Oh. Someone needs to design the hardware UI and UX. So the user interface and user experience, which will include especially the type, position, and behavior of LEDs, of buttons, displays, connectors, buzzers, whatever you might have in mind. Of course, as I said, somebody has to define it and design it before an engineer is not really placing it on a PCB and making it happen. Then, of course, someone might need to design the software UI UX. So imagine that you want that your product is including a PC, a software, an app, a web, or a cloud. And also there, someone actually needs to design all these elements before it can go into the development. And also for package and package content, like cables, chargers, manual, accessory, someone needs to design it before actually someone cannot develop it and, yeah, prototype it. Um, in average, you will spend on this phase one to five thousand US dollar to design all the different elements and items. But of course, it depends now if you need, let's say, also an app and web and cloud uh, design, how many pages it's including, and so on. Uh, so basically, you can make it much simpler, but you can also make it very complex and spend a lot of money in actually designing and branding the entire user experience. After the, the design is finished, now engineers will start touching it and doing something out of it, which will include usually mechanical engineering, it will include electrical engineering, it will include firmware development, which is the software that is running inside the device. Then there will might be some software development in case your product is connecting somehow to PC or laptop. There might be some app development if your product is connecting to smartphone or tablet. And there might also some web or cloud development in case you have a cloud backend or front end or something where people can interact directly. And of course, even the package or package content development might need some engineer to take now the beautiful design and convert it into something a factory can produce. So looking on all the different things which you might need to develop the product, you will spend actually also here an average one to five thousand US dollar per iteration. And it doesn't matter if you hire own engineers or if you use external ones, the, the in-house engineers will also not do it for free. So depending, as I said, how complex it is and how experienced the people you're using, you will spend, as I said, a thousand dollar to five thousand US dollar just to make now one iteration of developing all the different items. After the development is done, um, of course, you want to hold something, you want to try something out and see if it's looking, feeling, and doing what it should do. So now this is the phase where prototyping is starting. And here you will prototype the mechanic by using CNC milling or 3D printing, laser cutting, silicon mold, or something else. You might prototype the electronic using PCB, FPC, BOM, PCBA, some quality control, uh, optical inspection, X-ray, or whatever you might need. You might, of course, also prototype the package and accessory. Then someone needs to combine, debug, and optimize the things. So someone needs to take the mechanic and the electronic and the firmware, put it together, and try out if it's working. 
And of course, also test the whole product first by yourself, but later on maybe by a test group, which can be your target customer, it can be yourself, it can be your family, it can be best friends, it can be someone else. Then of course, you should collect the list of changes for the next version. And if you are not 100% happy with the design or with the result, you should iterate, iterate the three phases. So design, development, and prototyping again till you're actually ready for market validation. You don't want to go on Kickstarter, Windiegogo, or even to an investor with a product which even you don't like. So if you don't like something on the first prototype, go back, change the design, develop something different, prototype it again, and test it again till you are so happy with it that you are fine showing it now to the market or to investors and do the next step. Now, on the prototyping part, also here you might spend in average 1,000 to 5,000 US dollar per iteration. But of course, it depends how complicated your product is. A simple PCB might be much cheaper, but now electronic with mechanical enclosure, some plastic, some metal or whatever, is of course adding cost. If you even want to add a package, then it will get even more expensive. And depending how big your product is and how many units you need, you might actually spend easily even more than 5,000 US dollars just on prototyping that beautiful thing. Okay, after are happy with the prototype in your hands, we highly recommend that you don't just pro start producing it, but you do a market validation. So the market validation you will need to make to define branding and market positioning because you want to, to define your name, your logo, your brand latest at that point. Before it was not necessary, but now you are hitting public space, you hit online page, you hit other people. So you need to define all these things to define. Do you want to be to Apple of your product line or you want to be more a ZTE or something else? You need to do some pre-launch marketing, which might include setting up your social media channel, setting up landing page, getting newsletter subscribers and everything else. Uh, you might need to prepare your campaign, which is including story, the page itself, the video and all the other things. You will need to execute the campaign as soon as you're ready. And of course, also the follow up. Plus, after it's done, you want to do a transition to an own website, web shop, or sales. And of course, make sure that you deliver and that on time. Okay. So, even for the market validation, there is actually a lot of work to do, which is not necessarily related to your product, but it's more heavy on marketing, on sales business development to now show the world that your product is great and that the people know that it's existing out there because if they don't know it then it doesn't matter how great your product is no one can buy it okay and the average cost you might spend on that is so from our experience five thousand to fifteen thousand us dollar so here it depends a lot how much money you spend on making a pretty video so we see people making video with their own iPhone camera and they're fine with that, while some people are spending a few thousand dollars hiring a, a video company which is making a professional video, is doing some special effects, a nice intro, outro, video overlay, voiceover and stuff like that. Also, we see that you can go with a very cheap, let's say, P PR budget, but on the other side, you can, of course, spend money to boost your product on Facebook, to spend some money on Google Ads, to pay for some newsletter subscribers, to get some campaigns, or even pay some PR companies to boost your reach and get more people in the same time. So here, basically, you can easily spend less than that, but you can spend also easily more than that, depending how much budget you have or how successful you want to become. After your product, uh, your market validation is successful, then actually you know the market wants your product. So this is not a step where you should go into mass production very fast, because now people want your product and you have to deliver it. Okay, which means uh, we go into the market, the mass production phase. And um, many people underestimate especially that part. So mass production for the first production is not the same like for the second or third or fourth production. The production for the first part is the most difficult, the longest one and the most expensive one. And why, I will show you quickly. So before the first mass production, you will need to make a final DFM check, which means you have to confirm that every single detail of your product 
is designed for manufacturing, which means the mechanic needs to have draft angles to be ready for tooling. Your PCB needs to have the right a hole size and, and via size and all the other stuff. Your bomb needs to be cost optimized. Many other things need to be optimized in such a way that you can produce it reliable again and again and that for low cost without any issues. Because if you still have an error inside your product, then you will now produce this error a million times. Second thing is you or your partner needs to source the supply chain, need to negotiate with the supply chain and confirm that this is what you need. So you can go with one turnkey solution, which is producing everything for you, or maybe you, you want to go cheaper or you want to protect your IP, then you will decide to use the PCB factory for making the PCB, another factory to make the PCB assembly, another factory which is making the injection molding, and then another factory which is making the final assembly, another factory which is making the package, and again, a different factory is putting everything together for you. And so basically, you will need to manage actually all these different guys. You need to negotiate with them and actually bring them together that at the end of the supply chain, you are getting exactly what you wanted. You will need to prepare all the manufacturing fixtures like tooling. So tooling for, for your plastic cases, you will need calibration fixtures for calibration, testing fixtures for testing your product, and all the other magic. You will need uh, right assembling, testing, calibration fixtures, but then also building samples for EVT, so engineering verification test, DBT, design verification test, but also for certifications like C and FCC. Because without these tests, you don't know is the product ready. And without CE and FCC or UL for the European and American market, you can even not sell the product. Um, you will need to do your EVT after that. So after you build the samples, you will need to do your DVT with the samples. And of course, also to run your certifications, which might contain CE, FCC, and MFI, for example, for the product. And if you fail, then you have to modify your product and you have to build new samples till actually you pass them all and better you get them on the level that you pass them. Otherwise you produce a few thousand products and they're actually not working or something is wrong or they're breaking after a few days or weeks in your customer's hands. Uh, you will need at some point to verify not just that the product is 100%, but also that the production is 100%. So the, the PBT, the, the production validation test is now like a small run of, of just a few hundred units where you will sit with a stopwatch and watch the manufacturing line, how they are producing your product, how many seconds do they need for every single step, what can they do wrong, what can they do better, where do they need a small little machine maybe to make sure that they do no mistakes, where you, do you need to adjust maybe your quality control and structure to make sure that they can now produce a few hundred units reliable and later on a few thousand units without making any problems. And only after this is done, actually, you will be able to do the final acceptance test where the client should confirm that he's accepting the golden sample and also the line itself or not. And only after this, actually, you can now do the mass production itself. After you did it one time, then it's finished. You can still optimize, of course, but actually then you just produce again and again and again and again. And because it's the first time you might easily, uh, okay, you will measure, analyze, optimize, and then repeat. Uh, because you did it the first time, you will actually spend easily between 30,000 to 150,000 US dollar just for preparing the production. The biggest cost and time drivers on this one are tooling. So basically, if your product contains any kind of plastic parts, then you can spend in simplest way 5,000 US dollar for the tooling for it. But if you have, let's say, a more complicated tooling, you spend easily maybe 20 or 30,000 for that. If your product contains multiple parts and pieces, double injection molding and all the other stuff, I've seen products which where the client spent 300,000 US dollar just for the tooling. And he had 20 different molds for 30 different pieces, which had to be all tested and optimized. And it takes at least a month to prepare the tooling. So till T0, in average, like two more weeks, two weeks more to actually optimize it. So just that part, the so part three, might take you easily, as I said, six weeks and let's say 10, 20, 30,000 US dollar just to create the tooling itself. 
The second biggest cost factor is actually the certification tests. So here it will take in average two weeks for the testing, in total four, maybe even six weeks to prepare all the documents. And you will spend maybe five, 10, 15,000 US dollar for every single country, because let's say for America, for Europe, for Japan, for Australia, you will need actually other kind of tests which you have to pass, but you need to pass them if you want to sell to that country, okay? And then the other parts actually are not that big, but especially tooling is very expensive and time consuming, and the certification tests are big and time consuming. And unfortunately, there's not much you can save about that. So this is something which is going to a test house or to a factory, and you have to make it to make a product happen, okay? Now, after production is finished, hopefully already in parallel, you um, should prepare your sales, which can be either online sales. So you might want to design your own online store. You have to set up and implement it. You have to host it and run it. So that's now start making money for you. Um, you can, of course, also not use your own online store, but design a page that is going on an Amazon marketplace, on eBay, on something else. But in, in any case, you have to design something, you have to implement it, you have to host it by yourself on the platform, and you, have, you need someone to actually run it. Um, on the other side, you can also go for offline sales, which means that you will need to research and select potential distributors. You might need to connect to the decision makers at the stores, you might need to negotiate and sign your first order, including the payment terms and so on. Plus, of course, you need continuously to maintain them, to manage them, keep relationship, make sure they order, make sure they're happy, make sure you get enough feedback that your sales and their sales is growing all the time. Um, and on this one, you will spend an average 5,000 US dollars. So it doesn't matter if you go for designing and branding and advertising your online part or your offline part, okay? After your sales is up and running, you will need, of course, to take care of fulfillment. And fulfillment will contain, in average, warehousing. So it will uh, contain some kind of warehousing uh, either in one place or in continental hub. So you might have one hub in Asia, one in USA, one in Europe, depending how worldwide you're actually selling. You might need uh, either some kind of small batch fulfillment to end customers. You might ship directly from that hub, for example, from the factory to your end customer in Paris, in Berlin, in New York, and whatever. Or you might do actually big batch fulfillment to local distributors, which will then distribute to the stores or end customers. And of course, you have to track uh, stock, you have to track shipping, track orders, but also you need to then actually create sales forecast ahead of time to be able to produce before you or your distributors are running out of stock. And uh, of course, you have to do the just in time production plus buffer to make sure that, that if people like your product, they don't have to wait for it, but actually they can directly buy and get it as soon as possible. Um, plus, of course, you have to, uh, to manage different options like colors, uh, certifications, package, manual, or language for different countries. Because maybe your package for the French market is different than for the German market, is different than for the American market, the Japanese market, Brazilian, or something else, which includes also, as I said, the manual or even the color or the design, how you uh, present the, the product itself. And the average cost for this is minimum $1,000. So whatever it is, so it can be just you ship and this is it. But this is, you can make it bigger where you need warehousing, where you need, let's say, pay someone for fulfillment. You might also pay for shipping if the customer is not shipping for it and so on. So basically here, $1,000 is the minimum you will spend on time and money just to make it happen. The last step, which many people happily ignore for the first product, but it is important, is after sales, like it or not, which might include customer support. It might include warranty. It might include replacement of parts of products, of broken things. It might uh, contain maintenance, especially if you do a B2B product or something which needs to run for many years. Uh, you, it might contain recycling and it needs to follow local regulations. So even you do not want to make any after sales in countries like Germany, like France, like America, there are regulations where you have to do 
warranty for a certain amount of time. You have to do recycling for, for a certain amount of time. Depending what your terms are with your distributor, you might need to do also replacement, maintenance, or even customer support, at least in a very simple way. So it can be customer support on email, on telephone, using email tickets or something else, but totally without customer support, you will fail. So you better you do it and you do it good, then your customer will be happy. If you forget that part, then it will take you too long to set up customer support uh, before actually the client's already unhappy and just running away. And mostly it will require local language. So trying to do customer support uh, in just English might work, but depending who is your target customer, if it's not the grand, so old people, old people in France and Germany, they might not speak good enough English. So if you want to sell to them, you will need to offer customer support in their local language, otherwise it will not work out. Similar also for Brazil, for Japan, some people might speak good English, but most people not. So if you target this market, then either your product is so simple that it don't need explanation, there are no problems and so on, or actually you need to create custom support for the language or you will fail. Um, unfortunately, this part is very specific to the offered product or service. If you do an IoT smart home device, or a health tracker or something for old people or babies or for food or for, I don't know, or for fashion. So depending on what it is, it will be a very different customer support, but actually you need to create that specifically for that product or service you're offering. Um, also here, your average cost will be at least a thousand dollars just to set everything up. But if you do many countries, many languages and need even a whole team for that, you might spend happily much more than that, okay? Now, um, why do we know that? Why do I know that? Um, it is actually quite simple. So because we, so the company I'm running is actually simplifying complexity by providing a turnkey solution from idea to market. So actually what we are doing since five years is we are helping our clients with all nine different fields of product lifecycle to make it happen. Some customers are choosing all of that uh, and, and we just run it all for them, but why some customers are saying, oh my God, I, I do everything by myself or using a different party, but I don't have mechanical engineers, so I need your team to, to do mechanic and our team will do the electronic or the software development, for example. Um, here you see just eight products which we've been involved in the past. They all ended on Kickstarter or Indiegogo, raised anything between a few hundred thousand till actually here 750,000 ranging from sous vide cooking device for American customer, a robotic kit for a Chinese customer, a lifestyle lamp for another American customer, a, let's say hat wearable device, which is telling you how much you are focused or relaxed for another American customer, here for a German customer, a modular smartphone case for a Swiss customer, an offline password keeper, again, the sous vide cooking device in a second version for the San Francisco customer, and one sheet, uh, basically an Arduino module for an Egyptian customer. But actually we have been involved in more than 600 projects in the past five years and more involved in more than 3 million crowdfunding for customers from all over the world. So basically we did many steps already for many, many products and we see how much time and money either they spent for it or we had actually spent to make it happen, okay? So this is basically where, where all the data is coming from. Now, just quickly summarizing the nine different items, uh, as I already mentioned, you have to cover idea, design, development, prototyping, market validation, mass production, for, uh, sales, fulfillment, and after sales. And the numbers which I mentioned to you are listed on the right side. So you will see, as I said, that on design, development, prototyping, it depends a lot on the complex complexity of the product. And depending how good you are, you might be finished after one or two iterations, but it, let's say if you need more iterations or you have more ideas or whatever, you, may, you might spend easily even more than that. On market validation, it's actually quite a fixed number where you should spend at least $5,000 to make a good campaign. Otherwise, if you make, try to make it cheaper, the video will be crap. You don't have any budget for, for, for advertisement. You don't have any budget for PR and so on. So if you spend actually ten dollars or 15000 you can do actually a very good... Uh, campaign, including spending money on good video and campaign and, and let's say PR, but especially the mass production part is something 
what many people underestimate how expensive it is and that it will take easily three to six months actually just to prepare the mass production set. After this is prepared, then you just run the production again, one month by one month by one month, and you spend just as much money as the product costs. Okay, but the first preparation really, really takes time. And then of course, sales fulfillment and after sales depends now on you if you make it really low budget or if you spend a significant amount of money on that, okay?